I'm very, very happy. Welcome, everybody. I'm very happy to introduce uh, a colleague and a friend, Nicholas Waldman. He's a sedimentologist and he's working both in uh, marine and lacustrine settings and he's based at the, um, in, at the um, University of Haifa, Department of Marine Geosciences. Uh, and uh, he did his PhD in uh, Geneva, in Switzerland, uh, with uh, Arizegi. And after that, uh, he moved to um, IFA. And uh, he has a be very beautiful lab in IFA, uh, which is called the Basin Analysis and Petrophysical Laboratory. And uh, he specialized in paleoclimate reconstructions uh, uh, using lake records mainly. And uh, so he will talk today about uh, uh, reconstructing uh, paleoenvironmental conditions and climate variability during the Plyo Pleistocene transition in the Levantine corridor. And uh, it's up to you now, Nicolas. Okay. Thank you very much, Ilaria. I'm very honored to have been invited to All Roads Goes to Rome, hopefully soon. I will actually be in Rome physically and not uh, virtually. Um, so thank you again. Um, so I'm going to talk about the, how the Pliocene and Pleistocene transition looks in the Levantine Corridor in this part of the Eastern Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. Okay, here we go. First of all, um, temperature variability latest years have been characterized by a lot of input to be uh, in the world media uh, by uh, how the planet is warming and uh, <clears throat> and the increasing temperatures uh, in the atmosphere so several graphs show and several models show how these temperatures are going up as you can see from the present well this is in 2005 has been uh, the, the last, well one of the last measurements and show how one way or the other models are predicting an increase in the temperature that it can be up to five degrees, uh, four degrees more than uh, today. Uh, and if we look at the, the LGM, you have here a very uh, clear graph of how the world was five um, degrees lower than uh, today, um, done by uh, several records uh, in the planet. But if we go back in time, you will see that basically the high temperatures model and predicted for the future are not something which is not peculiar in the planet. And we have reached these temperatures already in the last interglacial period, as you can see here, but also far into the past. In this case, I'm showing just the Pliocene, although the original graph taken from Bulke 2018 goes until the Cretaceous. <clears throat> but uh, the Pliocene, why the Pliocene is so important actually? Because the Pliocene is the last period in time in which temperatures were consistently consistent higher than today, as you can see here. And the temperatures were mostly, the mean average temperatures were higher than today, and in many aspects, similar to what our future uh, models, the models are uh, predicting for the future. So studying the Pliocene is one of the, in my point of view, one of the uh, most interesting uh, um, subjects to understand how is the world behaving, climatically speaking, with no humans influencing climate on the planet. But if we see also <clears throat> the CO2 particles, uh, CO2 parts per million in the atmosphere, you can also see, again, starting from the Industrial Revolution, increased into the mod increased to the present and several predicting models. I mean, it's very uh, highly studied and all this, that all of them are predicting some kind of a substantial rise for after the 400 ppm in the atmosphere. Some of them are predicting getting do down if several conditions will happen, but most of them are predicting far beyond um, the a typical 400 ppm that basically characterize the Pliocene. Again, Pliocene is the last time in which we have an atmosphere with CO2 
uh, um, part per million in the atmosphere which is as high as the present and as expected in the future. So again, we have uh, an exceptional period of time in which conditions, also the geographic conditions of the planet are similar to those of today. We are, when we are talking about uh, uh, 200 million years ago or 400 million years ago, that the records are showing far beyond present or far beyond the 400 ppm, but this is another planet. The configuration of the oceans are totally different and the heat distribution in the planet is totally different. So we are talking about a totally different planet. But the Pliocene is very similar to those conditions occurring today. So that's why the Pliocene is one of the best near analog to understand current trends in climate warming. And in the increasing importance of the Pliocene is also uh, put in emphasis in the latest uh, IPCC 6 uh, assessment reports from 2021, in which the period is highlighted as, and I quote, the most recent interval would mean global temperature substantially warmer for a sustained period of time, which is two degrees to three degrees above pre-industrial temperatures, and also is the most recent interval with an atmospheric CO2 concentration likely higher than pre-industrial values, and the most recent period that continents and ocean basin had a similar geographical conf configuration at present. This is exactly what I mentioned, and it's very well mentioned in the IPCC report, which luckily I have also the, the, the uh, honor to review part of it. So, but eventually I'm showing also the Pliocene, pl Pliocene Pleistocene transition, to so the transition to the Pleistocene, we're moving toward the cooling Earth, basically. And several mechanisms were proposed to explain the global cooling and the onset, onset of northern hemisphere glaciation during the places. And one of them, for instance, is the Panama Seaway closure, which uh, occurred somewhere between 13 to 2.5 million years old <clears throat> ago, sorry, which increased the salinity contrast between the Pacific and Atlantic Ocean and induced the northwest oceanic heat transport variability. Another um, um, mechanism is the collapse of permanent El Nino uh, in the equatorial Pacific or the tropics as well, that the appearance of cold surface water in the East Equatorial Pacific around 3 million years ago may have contributed to global cooling and modified the global climate's response to Milankovitch cycles. Another one, of course, is the mountain belts uplift like the Rockies or the Alps that may have cooled the northern hemisphere and promoted growth of ice sheets due to changes in atmospheric circulation patterns. And the last is the carbon dioxide. CO2 concentration during the mid-Pliocene has been estimated to around 400 ppm by volume, but decreasing levels during the Pliocene may have contributed substantially to a global cooling because this started to actually decline during the Pliocene, not during the Pleistocene. But one way or the other, in order to really know, we, we probably need some kind of a time machine that unluckily still we didn't invent it. But since you know we are all geologists, instead of using this beautiful time machine, we just go to our sedimentary record. <coughs> Sorry. Such as in this case, what I'm picturing, the lost plateau in China. But when we are talking about the Pliocene, <coughs> mostly we are talking about marine records. And as you can see here, this is the uh, Baudau set in 2015. It depicted all the Pliocene uh, records, marine archives in the ocean. And of course, you can see that there is a pretty good distribution, although we lack a lot of information what is happening here, of course, in other areas like the Arctic. <clears throat> but also we are lacking in the continents and in the Mediterranean area. <coughs> Sorry, when we go to the, <clears throat> to the Mediterranean, this is the way it looked like, the Mediterranean <clears throat> during the Pliocene. <clears throat> Sorry, by a paper of Nobauer in 2015, reconstruction of uh, done by many um, continental sites, as you can see also a lot of Italy. You have a lot of uh, Pliocene in Italy, I remember while visiting there and also Greece and so on. Again, some areas that uh, we don't know much, but in any case, I'm concentrating here in the Eastern Mediterranean and in Israel. And to be honest, we don't know much. When I saw this lagoon during the Pliocene, I was thinking, well, I don't know how the hell he got that information, 
but apparently it was something over there, which is interesting. And I'm concentrating in this part, trying to understand how the Pliocene was over there, climatically speaking. <clears throat> so uh, we are dealing with this part of the uh, uh, of the, the East Mediterranean, and more consistently the Levantine Corridor. Sorry, the Levantine Corridor, which is this one, okay, connecting Africa with the rest of uh, Euro Asia. And over there, there is uh, that will be northern Israel, okay. And over there, we have a site which is the Erek El Ahmar, exactly on the border between Israel and Jordan. Now, <clears throat> the Erek El Ahmar formation basically it's um, 150 meter long lacustrine sequence exposed south of the Sea of Galilee. What you see here, this is the Jordan River. Okay, it's very it's very challenging. I will be honest, very challenging to work here because this is the Jordan River, which is the actual border between Israel and Jordan, and this over there is the fence, which is the fence bordering Israel and Jordan. So basically the outcrop is in between the fence and the Jordan River. So we need authorization from the army to actually get there. Um, luckily I got a phone number in which I know who to call to get that, that authorization. Sometimes they give it, sometimes they don't, but one way or the other we succeeded to actually go there and work on these outcrops. And this is the only site that you can find them. And also over there as you can see our cars, we did some other investigation that I will show you. The formation is tilted at 15, 20 uh, degrees uh, eastward, actually is east, so southeast, we measured two weeks ago. And this is due to post-depositional tectonic activity. Of course, we are in an active environment. This is the Dead Sea Transform Fault, which is a major plate boundary between the Sinai microplate, part of Africa, basically, and the uh, 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 um, Ashen Plate over there. Previous studies attempted to chronologically constrain the formation by paleomagnetism. This was done in 2001, and cosmogenic isotopes, this is one done 10, 10 years later. The sedimentary sequence <clears throat> is therefore constrained according to these two issues, these two techniques, to something between 3 to 4.5 million years ago. Yet, the plus minus here is a little bit big, and we are trying to in to increase the resolution and to improve the resolution with other techniques. We are still, we don't have the answer yet, but trying to use ESR to improve the cosmogenic. And so the, the last word has not been done yet. Interestingly, uh, previous studies also identify a mammoth task, task in the Erekel Ahmad formation outcrops. However, not in this outcrop, but in another outcrop in which the stratigraphical correlation between these two Outcrop is totally it's very difficult and there is no way to correlate. Okay, so it's still unknown. <coughs> but whatsoever, this finding is providing a window of opportunity to learn about the Pliocene mammalian fauna in the region, not only uh, mammoths, they found other mammalian, other um, fossils over there, but this is the most impressive one and very well preserved but also he's pointing to a total different environment that doesn't exist anymore in this part. So, <clears throat> this is the main outcrop uh, exposed. This is the other outcrop, actually this is bigger and this is in the back side. So between this one and that one, there are something like 300 meters away. So it looks smaller, but actually it's thicker. So over, what you see here is the samples that were part of the samples that we know the chronology by the previous, um, work the cosmogenic ages but we have improved the sampling and say and took over 150 samples retrieved from the main lacustrine sequence for geochemistry and for sedimentology and also for improving the chronology the outcrop study was <coughs> coupled by a 20 meter long core which is the erk2 core we since then we took another two but i'm showing this one with a core recovery of 95 percent which is pretty good for this kind of environment and for the techniques we use. It was a push core with some relation. It's a physical analysis. We're done. Magnetic susceptibility, density, grain size using um, uh, an MCL and also a, a Malvern sizer. And geochemical measurements in an XRF in, in my lab were done at high resolution in the core. So this is the core that we uh, obtained. This is a 19, almost 20 meters. 
And basically just by watching the color, you can see here something more um, gray and something more brown and something more yellow. And just by looking at this large scale sedimentological characterization, we divide it into three main units, mythological unit one, two, three. This is the approximated age that was done by cosmogenic isotopes. Um, although it's a big uh, uncertainty, but I just show, just so you know that it's somewhere around there. And again, you can see a brown clay material, more browny, more uh, less, more massive, less uh, internal structure. But when we see the lower part, you see some layering in some internal structure and sedimentary features and some, maybe some events, we don't know. I mean, we need all the time to remember that we are dealing in a tectonic setting in which some kind of event we may have. Interestingly, the general thing that we have found just uh, browsing through the core, we found lots of fish tooth, plenty, lots of ostracods, plenty, and also, interestingly, some mammal bones that we didn't expect. And in this case, if Pika of the genus Ochotona, I'm sorry if I don't mention it right, basically we're talking about this beauty animal that currently lives in the Alps. So it's a totally different environment. We don't find that animal here. And this is interpretation of a colleague of mine, of mine here at the University of Haifa, a zooarchaeologist. <clears throat> so, um, interesting finding just by browsing the core. Then we did some investigation on the lithology. We did a uh, grain size that you can see here and some end members uh, analysis. And again here, we, oops, sorry. And again here, uh, we see that the variability in the grain size and in the end members follow a little bit the, um, the units. Okay, for instance, uh, end member three, we can see a variability that it's very striking following the lithological description and the, div the division between the different stratigraphy. <clears throat> and this helps us to understand the different processes that provide the, uh, uh, the different uh, particles, clay to sand. When we go to the XRF um, results, this what, well, the XRF next to the magnetic susceptibility. Again, uh, here there is, I highlight the different unit to clarify a little bit better, and we can see some tendencies occasionally um, uh, disturbed by uh, internal uh, layers, but some tendencies that they are uh, different between the different uh, units, pointing to different stages in the lake. This is what an initial interpretation of the XRF will uh, say, will show. Also, sorry, also I forgot to mention the total organic carbon to Total inorganic carbon is very obvious. There is a striking change with much more total organic carbon in unit one and almost nothing in unit two and three. So there is a striking difference between these two units, and something is happening also with the upper unit that you can see, for instance, in the magnetic susceptibility or in the chlorine composition uh, of the sediments. <coughs> When we see, we plot, the, uh, we do the um, statistical analysis of, on the uh, XRF uh, measurements. Uh, again, you can see unit one, two, three, the different colors. You can see that they are divided. You can see the blue and the red, they are falling some kind of uh, in a different, uh, in a similar area, while the yellow units, unit one, which is the one below, it's falling somewhere else. And basically, again, here you have two kinds of environment. This one's below and the other one above. Two type of environment, probably something which is a high lake level, a low lake level, two type of condition, probably desiccation. This is an initial interpretation of, of, of this data, which basically when you mix everything, you can already suggest, we can already suggest that those elements are probably pointing to to some kind of allochthonous fluvial input, mostly, coming from the basalts surrounding the area. The chlorine, sulfur, and calcium probably pointing to autochthonous processes occurring during mostly a higher lake level stage, I will say. And the potassium is pointing to an eolian input, um, which is substantial also in this uh, part of um, the planet. 
we have also initial results from biomarkers uh, done by uh, Dr. Lisa Castaneda from University of Massachusetts. This is ongoing work. And we just try initially to see uh, what uh, can we receive from the data. And we were surprised that the preservation is so good, actually. And you can already see that there is a striking difference between the alkane concentration in the lower part, in, the, in, in uh, unit one, and when compared to uh, unit two. We don't have samples from unit three, unfortunately, but this is an initial uh, <coughs> measurement. Again, also the same with GDGT concentration and with the alkane. So there is some kind of a difference occurring between the lower part, uh, unit one, and the upper part, unit two. And our internal, in, in, our, our initial interpretation is that there is an increase in C3 plants in the upper part with probably maybe a low lake level situation, while an increase in alkalinity and C4 plants with a high lake level condition, which was also generating anoxia in the lower units in the hippolymnium. And probably also that's why we have a high concentration of uh, total organic carbon and also more C4 plants. What is striking here that the upper part we interpret as probably more colder condition or colder, more colder than the one below that was warmer. But this is totally different from the present situation in which um, the humidity, the precipitation in Israel, if this is true, our initial uh, interpretation, we are talking about much more precipitation coming in an environment with a high lake level and in a warm condition rather than a cold condition, which is exactly the opposite when we are dealing with the Holocene or the late Pleistocene. Okay, examples come from the lake, uh, lake uh, from the Dead Sea in the previous Lake Lisan, which I'm not showing because otherwise this talk will not be 40 minutes, will be much longer. But my point is that we have a sev uh, 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 apparently a different situation of today. <clears throat> uh, of course, we are still ongoing work. I will have a new postdoc student that should come next month, basically. And we are going to increase the biomarkers and also do some isotope geochemistry and increase all this. All this is pretty new. I uh, also show you some uh, interesting results from marine archives, but in this case, coming from a 3D uh, seismic um, uh, survey. In this case, it's the Salamira, which is in front of the central uh, Israel. There are no cores here, but we have information from the seismic itself and from uh, logging done on Mira uh, 1 well, which is one of those wells that was drilled since 2008 when they found a lot of gas basically in front of Israel and changed all the situation here. So what you can see here is the bathymetry ex extracted from the 3D seismic data. This is totally different. It's not a core, the core information, which is kind of cool, actually. So um, you have the bathymetry, and we can see some folds, some folding, but also this beautiful, you know, it looks like a river, but actually it's not, but it's a turbidity channel, and there are several over there that I don't show here in other seismic cubes. This is the Levant turbidity channel that comes basically connected to the discharge of the Nile, which is the largest river in the planet, and it's basically influencing all sedimentation in this area in the marine and also the continental part of Israel. So when we have a cross section uh, here, and also on exactly where the well is, you can see several uh, divisions of the seismic stratigraphy. I'm not going to get through this too much. This was published by uh, Yakufu Niazi in 2018, one of my students currently in Australia. And I'm not getting through very deeply, but um, but you can see here the Messinian evaporite unit. Okay, the top is very, very, very prominent. This is salt and highlight, highlight, sorry, and some gypsum and other stuff. And all that will be plyo places. And usually it's undivided. We don't know exactly where is the limit. Already we know since then, but this is undivided plyo places. And with several uh, seismic units based on different seismic phases. Okay, this is well laminated. It will call laminated in seismic. When we are talking seismic, we'll call it laminated, less laminate, more chaotic, transparent, and so on. So basically, there are. Um, 
this is, will be seismic unit one with seismic unit two, and then to B1, B2, to C, and to D. This is divided into two. And when we are having a best resolution highlighting this area, you will see some internal disturbance, okay? Which you can see like phase reversals and some chaotic internal structures. These are basically turbidity channels that they are inside the Pliocene um, record. So what is interesting that you have in the upper part, this will be units two, two, uh, 2B2 and 2B1. So the upper part will be more um, um, U-shape and the lower part will be more V-shape. And when we, and believe me, we analyze everywhere in this uh, seismic cube. So we got into a statistical resolution of those. And the interpretation when we mix that with the a gamma ray coming from the log, here you see B1 and B2, the gamma ray will show basically a tendency of uh, going down during this part, going up, going down, going up. This trend is basically implying increase in coarse material, decrease, increase, and decrease, basically pointing to, well, and what is interestingly, that it's mer merged with the type 1, type 2, type 2, and type 1, exactly the U-shape, V-shape, U-shape, V-shape uh, turbidity. So our interpretation is do we have a relative sea level <coughs> uh, uh, change in between it was higher, it was getting lower, uh, an increase in coarse material coming from the land, from the Nile in the deep, so the deep, deep, uh, deep center of the Levant, and then increase of the relative sea level, and decrease in the coarse material, and so on again, two times. But not only that, what we see here is that there is actually a lot of activity going on. There is a lot of fluvial discharge from the night, much more than the one that we see present, only one or two uh, to be these channels, but here we see plenty. So it was much more an active climatic system. Not only the sea level was oscillating here, but also a very active climatic system upstream in the Ethiopian highlands. So what we see here basically is an extra a, an extra latitudinal uh, indication of much more rain in this part during specific time of the Pliocene, okay? The age here is problematic, we know that, but we can put an, an, an age at the bottom because we know where the decision is and at the top, but somewhere here, we don't know the age, it could be potentially in the future to improve that thing, but there were some kind of more rain intensification of rains in the Ethiopian highlights, which we can see an extra tropical imprint in the Levant Basin here, okay? Now I move back to the terrestrial environment and another, again, in this case, the Ubedia formation, which is not so far. Erek el Ahmar is here, Ubedia is there. But now we are moving toward new um, ages. This is the early place to send, <coughs> coming back to the lake. Now about Ubedia formation. Ubedia formation got to be world famous in the 60s and 70s when they actually found the first site of Homo erectus outside Africa, okay? The formation has been widely studied for its fossils, which include a wide range of brachiopod, mollusks, and mammals. Tectonic forces have tilted and deformed the entire formation. It's some kind of an anticline. It's very complex, to be honest. Actually, this drawing in the 60s is problematic itself. We don't find really this structure, but it's folded. That's for one, that's for to be sure. And is estimated to have been deposited 1.5 million years ago. <clears throat> the entire unit is divided into four different, was divided in the, in the 60s into four different uh, units. Upper fluvial, upper limbic, lower fluvial, lower limbic, or leafy lufu, very easy. This was done in the 60s, but a new exploration campaign occurred actually uh, last year in which I was lucky to be uh, participating. They opened and the, the past range and improved and clean it, and it was fantastic work. 
in order to attempt to resolve the chronology and uncover new sedimentary layers. Over 300 samples were retrieved that are here behind my back, and they are currently being processed for geochemistry and sedimentological analysis. Currently, um, the physical, magnetic susceptibility, and grand size and geochemistry measurements are carried out in the outcrop. This is the way it looks like. Very well laminated, layered, beautiful, beautiful units. Really, really beautiful to work with. And you can see the high resolution sampling. It's not only for this lab, there are many groups here, the pollen people, the fossil people, the, you know, everybody was sampling. I think that the blues are mine. I don't remember right now. But anyway, um, the new outcrop study revealed excellent well layered sediments of the original description done in the 60s, but also uncovered new findings. Like there was a unit that they found a, a hippo, an hippopotamus, that they didn't know in the past. I don't show it, it's new data, so basically I can't. But a part of that, what we did, we did core in the site. As you can see here, we core in an angle to try to go for the uh, right um, uh, angle of the uh, that part of the sequence. And we succeeded to get a 70 meter long core, UBD1, core recovery of 97%, which is pretty good. The core section was subdivided Again, we uh, submitted to our multi-sensor core logger uh, with the P wave uh, density and magnetic susceptibility and geochemistry measurements and total organic carbon. This is the way it looked like part of the core. You can see very good lamination, a little bit disturbed by the core, by the drilling procedures, but still pretty good. So uh, for, um, for the situation and also pretty wet, which is very good. The conservation of the organic material is promising. So uh, <coughs> we estimate that the core reach deeper unit layers that are not exposed in Ubedia. The deeper units are laminated, the upper more uh, is upper most are less laminated. And the new coring provides uh, an opportunity to prove the possible orbital cyclicity of the sedimentary record and maybe to improve the chronology by providing that aspect of the information. This is the way the core look like. This is the top, this is the bottom. What you can see here is the grand size analysis done on the core. We are going to increase the resolution as well. And the magnetic susceptibility, which is very obvious that there are some events or some kind of uh, units or layers, and definitely something else occurring in the bottom. So my initial, totally initial interpretation here is that I can divide into three units at least. I don't know. This is totally initial interpretation, so please excuse me if I made an error here. This is done by one of my postdocs, in cooperation with my other students. And this is interpretation is initial, also based in the color of the sediments itself and in the grain site and in the <coughs> magnetic susceptibility. And again, we are doing all the rest of the geochemical measurements. Now our last record, I don't know how much time I have, but I hope that I still have time. Coming from Southern Israel. In Southern Israel, there are also remains of lakes, archives that, um, that now they don't exist, obviously. What you can see here is a map of Southern Israel, Jordan, and Egypt in Saudi Arabia with remains of uh, lakes dated for the lower Pleistocene, middle Pleistocene, early Pleistocene. Okay, you can see here the colors. And what I'm concentrating is on the Kuntila Lake, which is this one, that a third or less than a third is in Israel and all the rest is in Egypt. Kuntilia was a perennial lake that existed during the pluvial interval, somewhere in the pluvial interval of the early places. And the lake occupies, occupied an area of 300 kilometers square, which is pretty big. And obviously it requested some kind of a different um, hydroclimatic situation that now sustains such a, such a lake, perennial and relatively deep, in which currently in this area is something between five to 10 millimeter per year of rain. So it's an extreme hyperallied hyper environment, okay? Also, <coughs> the uh, map uh, reconstruction of the fluvial setting shows that most of the water came from the south Okay, from Egypt, which currently much of the, most of the water is coming somewhere else, okay? Not from there. 
interestingly, what you can see here doesn't have anything to do with the with the subject with the subject I'm showing, but you can see also the fluvial segments distorted by the uh, main Aravada Sea transform fault, and there are remains that you can find. So I mean, also there is a a, 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 a tectonic element disturbing here, but in one way or the other, that lake was an open system in which um, was uh, emptying its water eventually to the Dead Sea or the Dead Sea, the proto Dead Sea that already existed over there. But one way or the other, this was an active system, a perennial system, not the type of environment that characterized southern Israel and southern Jordan at all. Especially when you see the environment, I mean, it's extremely hyper arid, it's uh, very remote, also, it's not so easy to get there. <laughs> And, um, and and we went there. We went there three years ago, I think. And we redid, redone the columnar section that was done already by Yoav Avni. This is Yoav Avni, this is us, uh, with Stefan Mischke from Iceland and Juan Larsoania from Spain. So we took, uh, we did, uh, we redid the columnar section. We took, took several samples and we measured also the grand size the XRF and the total organic inorganic material and other measurements that I'm showing you just only those. One way or the other we identify five major units here again based on this data. There were some uh, we had only a few hours to be there so we had to rush there are some areas that we couldn't measure because of our logistics again it's very remote to get there and uh, we did it in winter that we didn't have enough uh, sufficient light, uh, light hours. So anyway, but we still, uh, it's, this is an ongoing project, but what is interestingly that we uh, did a new analysis of the biological diversity that showed that the Lake Contilla contains very few species of Ostracod, but most of them, they are regular crystallized takers of Eurialin Cyplides torosa, and few shells of Leo Cypris. I'm sorry if I don't mention it right. Which is typical for freshwater and running water, or Candona, which is freshwater environment. This is the interesting thing. Again, I'm not an ostracologist, um, ostracod uh, expert. This, in this case, is uh, Stefan Mischke, one of our colleagues. But the interpretation is showing a freshwater and running water. So it was an active environment, not a stagnant environment. And uh, Juan from um, Zaragoza, from Spain, he's a paleo paleomagnetologist. So we sampled the game for uh, Palomag, and we see a striking difference between the inclination and the declination occurring somewhere in exactly in the middle, in which there is a normal to reverse um, change. Now, obviously, this is not enough for having an age, but the uppermost layer is uh, there are archaeological artifacts of the Acheulean culture. Please remember, this is only a picture for um, for having an idea. This is not from the site, but the archaeological artifacts of the Acheulean culture they were dated by cosmogenic isotopes to the that unit to 1.9, 1.6 million years ago. So in such a case, we estimated that, that we are dealing with somewhere which is the transition of the old Dubai to the uh, CR1, C1R transition, which is somewhere 1.8 million years ago. If so, we are adding another dot in the important sites of the human, the early Homo erectus sites, uh, transition, uh, migration sites in the area, or evidence for Homo erectus in the area, like in the Missy, uh, which is very famous in Georgia. Ubedia, as I mentioned. Well, this is Alek El Ahmad is before, but, but there are other sites. And we are adding another dot for uh, the presence of hominins, early hominins in the area, in the Levant Core. And then we have also, we, we know from Ubedia and Alek El Ahmad that there are plenty of information about different kind of, uh, of mammalia in the region. So we are talking about a different type of environment at all. I'm getting to the end. Uh, so when we are talking about a different type of environment, we are talking about the climate, which actually it can show, it can point to. 
is it the Levantine corridor with the site that I was mentioning before? And when I put it in the context of the southern, in the Africa, because what we see is plenty of African fauna, the area, first of all, is highly um, impacted by the westerlies, which provide humidity from the East Mediterranean to the area. Okay, currently and during the past, at least, at least we know that it impacted on the, the last interglacial or the previous interglacial. But not so far from here, in the tropics, we have the uh, ITCZ in July that is impacted, impacting uh, uh, the tropics and providing humidity even until uh, northern Oman, well, over there. But uh, my uh, estimation is that precessional millennial scale modulation of the ITCZ may have influenced a northwards migration of the monsoonal rain system already since the Miocene, and probably it impacted a little bit. You move a little bit more north this during the Pliocene, and you are already providing with more water here, which is evidenced by the Lake Kuntila in the south or with uh, Erek el Ahmar, which is a deep day lake existing in a place that now there is no lake. So I estimate that there is some kind of an input from the southern sources of humidity. I'm not saying that it was a monsoon because by atmospheric circulation models, you cannot put a monsoon in 31 degrees north, but you can provide tropical storms coming from a north, northern um, migration of the monsoon and rain system to that part of the planet, okay? And basically when we are uh, watching global this, uh, I, I, I always like to see how basically in a large aspect we, we are located here and how that is connected to the rest of the, rest of the planet. We're dealing with, uh, with, African, with African or Indian Ocean uh, uh, tropical rain system that probably um, is connected to a modulation of the ITCZ in July, more north than present situation. So as a summary and conclusion, what we see I show you before is a well-channelized sequence in the Levantine corridor, in, sorry, in the Levant Basin that was identified in the Pliocene section of the Levant. The channels were divided into two types, U-shape, V-shape, and that they define some kind of an increasing rain occurring in the tropics during that period, which I say before. And um, parallel to a falling sea level change during that time. But also from the lacustrine stages, we can see large and deep lakes, Erek el Ahmar, Kuntila, Ubedia, in the early Pleistocene, appear to dominate the Levantine Corridor during the late Pliocene, early Pleistocene. And a series of measurements, physical, geochemical, and biological, which are currently being underway, we help us to reconstruct the past environment and climate conditions. Eventually, both marine and lacustrine records point to a different kind of uh, hydroclimate setting in this area, with an increase in moisture in the region, possibly influenced by a tropical sources of humidity during the Pliocene. And this has a very strong impact in understanding the forces, rather if intrinsic or extrinsic. I'm not answering that question right now, but providing with more important answers on how early hominins, uh, the Homo erectus, crossed this part of the planet, the Levantine Corridor, when he was migrating out of Africa to the rest of the planet, but also coming back, because he didn't follow an arrow, he just went, whatever, it has the possibilities to hunt, and it has the possibilities to survive. So we were an animal, a very wise animal, like the other animals around the the area, but understanding the environment before, during, and after this wise animal cross the region is a substantial knowledge for understanding our own kind. So I would like to thank all my students, uh, John Greenlee, who soon is going to be in the United States for a PhD, Chrissy Hall, already, who got a position last week actually in the United States, and Silas Dean, that is a postdoc and soon is going to be exported for a postdoc in uh, Italy. So you are going to have him. And my lab manager, Nimerta, and all the rest of the students that contribute in one way or the other. And this is part of the Israel Science Foundation. And much of what I'm showing here 
uh, belongs to uh, what they're doing. So I want to thank you.